I'm going to read today from Jeremiah chapter 9. Jeremiah in chapter number 9 is where I'm going to be reading from this morning. As I'm reading, though, Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet. And he wept, arguably, more than any other preacher in the Bible. And I want you to think about this. This is the same sermon that Dr. Ray started a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it's now three chapters later, but he's still uh, on the stairs of the temple, at the gate of the temple, and now he's crying. Did you ever have that moment growing up where someone was talking and then they were just so overwhelmed with emotion, maybe it was a parent, that they just started crying? It gave it different weight. Uh, maybe you, you had a teacher that was just teaching and and you just weren't, that teacher, he or she was not getting through, and the teacher just began to shed tears, and it just had different weight to it. That's what's happening in our text. Jeremiah is preaching, and he's weeping as he's preaching. Don't picture this as an angry guy yelling and no one's listening. If we're not careful, we get that, that, uh, that mindset of, of that person that just is angry preaching on the street and no one's listening to. But that's not it at all. He's burdened. He's broken. So let's read it together. Jeremiah 9, verse number 1. The Bible says, Oh, that my head were waters, and mine eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. Oh, that I had in the wilderness a lodging place of wayfaring men, that I might leave my people and go from them. For they be all adulterers, an assembly of treacherous men. They bend their tongues like their bow for lies, uh, but they are not valiant for the truth upon the earth. For they proceed from evil to evil, and they know not me, saith the Lord. Take heed every one of his neighbor, and trust ye not in any brother. For every brother will utterly supplant, and every neighbor will walk with slanders. They will deceive every one his neighbor, and will not speak the truth. They have taught their tongue to speak lies and weary themselves to commit iniquity. Thine habitation is in the midst of deceit. Through deceit they refuse to know me, saith the Lord. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will melt them and try them. For how shall I do for the daughter of my people? Their tongue is as an arrow shot out. It speaketh deceit. One speaketh peaceably to his neighbor with his mouth. But in his heart he layeth wait. Shall I not visit them for these things, saith the Lord? Shall not my soul be avenged on such a nation as this? For the mountains will I take up a weeping and wailing, and for the habitations of the wilderness a lamentation, because they are burned up, so that none can pass through them. Neither can men hear the voice of the cattle. Both the fowl of the heavens and the beast are fled, they are gone. And I will make Jerusalem heaps and a den of dragons. And I will make the cities of Judah desolate without an inhabitant. Who is a wise man that may understand this? And who is he to whom the mouth of the Lord hath spoken that he may declare it? For what the land perisheth and is burned up like a wilderness and none passeth through. And the Lord saith, because they have forsaken my law, which I have set before them. And have not obeyed my voice, neither walked therein, but have walked after the imagination of their own heart, and after Balaam, which their fathers taught them. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will feed them, even this people, with wormwood, and give them water of gall to drink. I will scatter them also among the heathen, to whom neither they nor their fathers have known, and I will send a sword after them till I have consumed them. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider ye, and call for the mourning women that they may come, and send for cunning women that they may come, and let them make haste and take up a wailing for us, that our eyes may run down with tears, and our eyelids gush out with waters. For a voice of wailing is heard out of Zion. How are we spoiled? We are greatly confounded, because we have forsaken the land, because our dwellings have cast us out. Yet hear the word of the Lord, O ye women, and let your ear receive the word of this mouth, and teach your daughters wailing, and every one her neighbor lamentation. 
For death has come up into our windows and has entered into our palaces to cut off the children from without and the young men from the streets. Speak, thus saith the Lord of hosts, even the carcasses of men shall fall as dung upon the open field and as the handful after the harvestmen, and none shall gather them. Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither the mighty man glory in his might, and let not the rich man glory in his riches. But let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me. I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth, for in these things I delight, saith the Lord. Father, we thank you for your word that we have in front of us this morning. And Lord, I pray that I would rightly divide your truth. Lord, I pray that that we would uh, receive your word with gladness and respond to your word today. I pray that you'd still our hearts, quiet our minds. And Lord, may your spirit give us exactly what we need. In Jesus' name, Amen. 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 Jeremiah here is lamenting the destruction of the people of Judah who have turned their back uh, on the Lord. And now it seems like that the only way they're going to respond is through the painful process of punishment. They have to go through the school of hard knocks. And Jeremiah is getting this picture of their future. Yet the nation doesn't believe Jeremiah. And he's standing there at the gate of the temple and he's preaching the word of the Lord, but no one believes what he's saying. They would rather believe the message of the other quote-unquote prophets who give a much softer message. They are saying, it's going to be okay. You guys are doing good. Everything is going to be fine. It's only going to get better from here. And Jeremiah is saying, not true. It's going to get worse. You have to repent of your ways or you are going to have to pay for your sins. And realize that it's not only a message of judgment, but also uh, he realizes the people are not listening. And, and, and it's like watching this slow moving uh, 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 boat that's about to hit an iceberg. And, and, and how uh, uh, frustrating it is that they're not paying attention to the message that he's preaching. And realize, hey, Jeremiah is saying it's so much better to weep now and, and, and avoid the judgment that's coming. He's saying, I don't have enough tears to cry. What a picture this is. Oh, that my head were waters and my eyes were a fountain of tears. I'm in verse 1. That we might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. Verse 2. Oh, that I had in the wilderness a lodging place of wayfaring men, that I might leave my people and go from them. In the first verse, he says, all I can do is weep for these people because of the coming judgment. Then in verse 2, he says, I I wish I could go and get a hotel room or or go go get an Airbnb out in the wilderness and just get away from them to where I was uh, around strangers because I, I can't even bear to be around these people. Their behavior is a constant reminder that God is grieved and they will be judged for what they're doing. And I wish I could get away from that. I wish I didn't have to see it. I wish I didn't have to talk about it. I wish I didn't have to preach against it. I wish I was in a hotel room in the middle of nowhere where I didn't have to see what's going on. The blatant rebellion against God. In Habakkuk, Habakkuk said, I wish I didn't have to see the burden. He's pained by the the future judgment, but he's also pained by the present status of God's people living in sin. Does... God's people living in sin bother you? I want you just to ponder that for a second. If we're not careful, we we misuse the word grace. Again, this is not a place where we go start judging other people's actions. But Jeremiah is bothered that they call themselves the people of God, and yet they're living nothing like the people of God. 
It ought to bother us as Christians when we look at a world that has turned its back against God. Verse number three, the Bible says, They bend their tongues like a bow for lies, for they are not valiant for the truth upon the earth. For they proceed from evil to evil, and they know not me, saith the Lord. And he goes to describe the, 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 the kinds of sin and examples of sin. And what an incredible metaphor here. He's like, it's, it's, it's like their mouth is a bow and arrow, and they speak, and it's like they're launching their words, or, or their words are arrows that are being launched with with intent to destroy, to be weaponized. Kind of a fitting uh, analogy, the week of the pre- first presidential debate. Uh, uh, we, we get into this political season and words become weaponized. And we, 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 we say, well, we, we justify our actions why we tear down somebody else. Or, and, and here... They, 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 but again, this is going beyond American politics. Now, this is talking about uh, uh, people saying things that are not true. But, but it's not just uh, 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 being dishonest. And this, it's, it's all their business dealings. And they're not faithful in their marriages. And they're not faithful in, uh, on their jobs. And they're not faithful in how they live. And no one can trust anyone. And they just go from one lie to another. And one of the reasons that they go from evil to evil is because they have no relationship with God. And Jeremiah is saying, you can't trust your neighbor, you can't trust your friend, you can't trust your brother, everyone is lying to somebody, everybody is in it for themselves. Folks, I'll be honest, uh, the number of times that I've heard Christians tell me, well, I just told a little white lie, but the reason I did was, and then it's like, well, my lie was okay, because here's the justification for my sin. There's, it, there's never a place for you to sin. There's never a reason for us to sin. There's never a reason for me to say, well, I had to sin because of. Sin is sin against God. And it's important we understand it was our sin that nailed our Savior to the cross. The reason Jesus went to the cross is because we sinned. Sin is a big deal. That just because nobody else saw your sin, just because somebody else didn't see the lie that you you told that was a lie doesn't mean that it wasn't a lie. It's important we understand that these people work so hard at lying, they were so good at lying that 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 the I mean they put all this effort into the rebellion against God. How incredibly sad that that they were living more and more and more like the world. A person's words And their honesty is arguably the best picture or indication of a person's heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And the reason it's so easy to curse, the reason it's so easy to lie, the reason it's so easy to gossip. I let you off the hook on the first two. You're like, those aren't mine. I got one for you too. I don't curse, Pastor. I, anyway, we're going to keep going, all right? That reveals what's in your heart. It's so important. Again, God doesn't deal with the external that everybody else sees. You and I see the external. God sees what's on the inside. Verse number 6, the Bible continues, Thine habitation is in the midst of deceit. Through deceit they refuse to know me, saith the Lord. You say one thing and do another. You'd rather just play the game, take advantage, but you don't want to get right, repent, do the right thing. Uh, uh, and, and, And sadly, the God of the universe knows your heart. You need to repent and turn to Him and live right. He wants to bless you. Again, they, they prided themselves in the law. They didn't live by the law. There, there, there was the Mosaic law where, where, where if you, God said, then I. And, and it's so important that they didn't do the if you. And they missed out on the blessings of God because they chose sin. Folks, can I say today, there are plenty of people that are missing out on the blessings of God because you're choosing sin. The way of the transgressor is hard. Sin is an incredibly hard path. 
It's a difficult life. It's miserable life. It's, it's, it, it, but it doesn't have to be that way. It's our choice. Choose you this day whom ye will serve. We need to realize that, that when we choose that path of bitterness, we choose that path of, of sin, sadly, we set ourselves up for the painful life. And so I'm going to give you three, I say three quick headings. Uh, they're, they're, they're not going to be super quick, uh, but, but, but I, I want us to go slow. And I, and I want us to get this and see the word of the Lord. It's heavy. It's deep. It's weighty. They didn't listen then. But my prayer is 2,500 years later, we do. And we get it. And we don't just say this is the word of the Lord, but we respond to the word of the Lord. So that we don't repeat what they did. The first header I want to give you is this. A den of dragons. A den of dragons. Verse 7. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will melt them and try them. For how shall I do to the daughter of my people? Uh, 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 the, the Lord of hosts name here is a particular name of God. It means the God of the army. Or the God that can win. Or the God that is on the march. Remember this, God's not going to take that lightning bolt and electrocute them, uh, but rather what he's talking about is this refining process of like silver or gold. And it's a rhetorical question here. Uh, it's, it's like a, uh, you know, have, have you ever been in this spot, adults, when you were a kid, when your mom's like, you know, I tried to ground you, that didn't work. I tried to spank you, that didn't work. I took away your Nintendo, that didn't work. What am I going to do with you? That, 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 it's a rhetorical question. That, that's what God is saying here. Uh, uh, in, in verse number 7, the, the Lord is, is, he said, I'm testing you, I'm trying you. Verse 8, their tongue is an arrow shot out, it speaketh deceit. deceit. One speaketh peaceably to his neighbor with his mouth, and his heart he lieth wait. So on the outside, their words are flattery. On the outside, they're, 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 you know, it's, it's like, this, you know, uh, sister so-and-so comes into church and, and, you know, oh, that dress is so pretty and I love that bag and your shoes match. And she's such a whore. Uh, <laughs> that's what they're talking about right here. That's what the Bible is talking about. And people living that exact life. We need to realize that, and God says, I'm going to visit you with judgment. And God is saying that, that I, I, I'm not going to just uh, let this pass over. Look at the end of verse 9. It says, shall not my soul be avenged on such a nation as this? When you speak of a soul, you're talking about the very core of their being, who they are. God is saying, I am moved by this. The, the, the word here for nation is the word that God would refer to like a Gentile nation. Like it was someone who didn't even know God. And these are his people. It's so sad. Look at verse number 10. The Bible says, For the mountains will I take up and weeping and wailing for the habitations of the wilderness and lamentation because they are burned up so that none can pass through them. Neither can men hear the voice of cattle. Both the fowl of the heavens and the beast are fled. They are gone. And here they lament for the, dis the, the lamentation for the disobedience of God's people is taken up. And he's saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to weep in the mountains because Typically, those are the places that they would run and hide when the battle was coming. That happened in the day of Gideon when the Midianites came. Jeremiah said, I'm, I'm going to run to the mountains. I'm going to hide there, try to find my safety there. But, but what the Bible is saying is there is no safe place. You know how as we come together like this on Sundays and we just feel safe from the world? We, we feel a little insulated from all the pressures and the weight of burdens and trials and worldliness and, and all of that. The Bible is saying the person that is living in their sin, there is no safe place for you. You have to repent. You have to get right with God. And it's so important. Verse number 10, it says, Both the fowl and the heavens and the beast are fled 
They are gone. It says the, the birds will run away, the cattle will run away. The picture is complete and utter desolation. 11, and I will make Jerusalem heaps. Here it is, a den of dragons. And I will make the cities of Judah desolate without an inhabitant. So we're talking about the mountains, the animals, the birds. But now we're talking about people. The judgment is getting more personal. It's getting serious. Sometimes in our lives, God is speaking and we don't do anything about it. The, the word dragon here, you could refer to like a coyote or like a jackal of some sort. Uh, it, it would be like the scavenger type dogs that would eat the dead flesh. Uh, that's what it's talking about, total destruction. The entire city was going to be uh, uh, vacated and some will die and their carcasses will rot Verse number 12, he says, who is the wise man? Again, this is a question that may understand this. And who is he to whom the mouth of the Lord has spoken that he may declare it? For what the land perisheth and is burned up like a wilderness that none passeth through. Now he's, he's saying, is anybody out there? Hello? Can anybody hear me? Is anybody paying attention? Are you listening? He's saying to the word. Folks, can I say if we're not careful, we can come in week after week after week after week after week and just live in the same habitual sin over and over and over again. And we're like, nothing happened. Everything's okay. It's all good. I'm going to be fine. And we can convince ourselves that our sin is kind of like our new toy that we have. And, and we just kind of hang on to it and play with it and, 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 and whatever it is and realize it is that sin that actually brings destruction. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Verse number 13. The Bible continues on. The Lord saith, because they have forsaken my law, which I set before them and have not obeyed my voice, neither walk therein. The reason for the destruction is they have an improper relationship with God. God said, I gave them my instruction." I gave them my law. Uh, uh, God says, I put my law right in front of them. He, 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 I gave you the very reflection, God is saying, of my character. You have received so much and you've rejected it. And isn't that where we live today in American Christianity? Nobody has been more blessed than us. We have incredible freedoms that we get to enjoy. I'm thankful that we live in the United States of America. I realize there's plenty wrong with our country, but I'm very thankful where I live. I'm thankful for the freedoms that I have. I'm thankful that I was able to roll out of bed this morning. And I had, not only did I have a bed, but I had a pillow. And not only did I have a pillow, but I also had a fan. Not only did I have a fan, but I also had a sheet. I only have a sheet, but I also had a blanket. Uh, uh, you understand this morning that, that, I mean, this is crazy. Somebody said, you look tall. You know why I wore my tall shoes today? I had a choice of which pair of shoes that I could wear. I came uh, and walked into the kitchen. And, and you realize, I know we can complain of what we don't have. But many of you had a choice. Am I going to have a bagel? Am I going to have cereal? Am I going to have oatmeal? Am I going to make ham sandwich? Am I, going to, am I going to have leftovers for breakfast? You had a lot of options today of what you want for breakfast. Uh, understand that, that if, if you chose to, uh, you, you, you uh, reached down and you picked up a Bible and you were able to read it. If you didn't, busted. Uh, uh, if, and you chose, I can read my hard copy or I can read the one on my phone, or I can read the one on my tablet, because you have multiple copies of the Word of God. And if you still had time, you turn on the TV, and then you had about 300 choices of what you were going to watch on TV. Then you had an option, am I going to make coffee in the coffee pot, or am I going to be like Pastor Ken and go to Dunkin' Donuts and make somebody else make it for me? Uh, we're very, very blessed. And if we're not careful, we complain about what we don't have and how tough life is and how miserable and oppressed we are. Folks, we are incredibly blessed. And, and sadly, if we're not careful, what we do is we just want more. We just want more blessings. Let's flip this thing on its side for a minute. 
You're so incredibly blessed. Who'd you tell about Jesus this week? Who did you tell about the blessings of God? Because we, it's almost like we find comfort in, in, in uh, uh, the misery of, of complaining instead of a gratitude and a heart for the Lord. And, and God uh, the, the, intended us to reflect His character, not the character of our flesh. God has been so good to us. Over and over again, God reminded Israel, I gave you food from the sky. I gave you shoes that didn't wear out. Uh, I fought your battles and you didn't even have to carry a sword. You were carrying a flashlight. Uh, uh, again, God's reminding them, I gave you fields you didn't plant. I gave you cities you didn't build. Folks, you're blessed today. To the person that you think you have the most to complain about, you are incredibly blessed today. And God has been good to you. Let's look at number two very quickly. I want you to notice with me a voice of wailing, a voice of wailing. The Lord was speaking to the essence of why his people are going to be judged. God said, you forsake my law. My law was right in front of you. Uh, it's not like you didn't have access to me. Uh, uh, it's that you refused me. It's that you chose that you didn't want me. Uh, verse number 14, the Bible continues on. But, we, but have walked in their imagination of their own heart and after Balaam, which their fathers taught them. When we don't follow the Lord, we follow something. And we're consumed with some type of desire. I know we're in gradu- at the tail end of graduation season now. And oftentimes, graduation uh, speeches, they, they include the phrase, follow your heart, or something along those lines. And, and people say that at times of graduation or times of decisions. But the Bible says the heart is deceitful. The Bible says don't follow your heart. The Bible says follow Jesus. Jesus will take you down the right road. Your heart will take you down the wrong road. And, and, and look at verse 15. Now, thus saith the Lord of hosts, again, the God of the battle. Now, the God of Israel. Behold, I will feed them, even this people, with wormwood, and give them water of gall to drink. Again, what this is, is it's metaphoric language for bitterness. God is saying you're going to reap what you sow. You're going to chase these idols. You're going to chase these false gods. Uh, you're going to find that, 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 that pathway from your heart. It leads to emptiness. It leads to bitterness. It leads to resentment against God. And God is saying that's what you're going to get in your life. You have a life that's chasing idolatry. It's not worth it. God is saying, I'm going to show you that by feeding you that. Look at verse number 16. I will scatter them also among the heathen. Uh, It says, uh, whom neither they nor their fathers have known, and I will send a sword after them till I have consumed them. So there's going to be captivity, there's going to be death and destruction in Jerusalem, and and they're they're going to be consumed. Verse number 17, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider ye, and call for the mourning women, that they may come, and send for the cunning women, that they may come. And we know this, as Jesus talked about this in the New Testament. Remember, in the New Testament, when somebody passed away, they would actually pay these mourners to come, and to weep, and to wail, and to grieve with the family and the preacher saying go ahead and call the mourners in and just have them start crying now and wailing now because it's about to get on it's 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 going to happen they're they're talking in verse 18 about the spoils of war and and realizing that they're going to lose it all folks to when you get to a place where you say i don't have any options that's what sin does Sin is destructive. Sin brings us to a place of utter destruction. Sin uh, uh, brings us to a place where you you have nothing is what he's talking about. Verse number 20, he continues on and and says, Yet hear the word of the Lord, O ye women, and, and let your ear receive the word of his mouth, and teach your daughters wailing, and everyone her neighbor lamentation. And so this isn't going to be quick and easy, like, okay, you cry, you say I'm sorry, and it's over. He said, no, you need to teach your children to cry too, because this is going to last for generations. As a matter of fact, it lasted for 70 years, because the judgment is going to come, and it's going to be painful. 
verse 21. The Bible says, For death has come up to our windows and has entered into our palaces to cut off the children from without and the young men from the streets. It's important we see that death is pictured here like it's creeping in. Like death is breaking into the house and climbing up the side of the house and entering in a window. Death is going to be no respecter of persons. And your status won't save you. And riches is not going to save you. And uh, your children are going to be in the street and they're going to have to pay. And what a sad day this is. Folks, the message is God doesn't play with sin. God doesn't think sin is cute. God does not think sin is funny at all. God doesn't think, oh, oh, shucks, well, he doesn't know any better. Sin is terrible. Sin separated mankind from a holy God. The only uh, way for us to get to God is through Jesus and his finished work on the cross. Let's go to the final point today as we see glory in knowing the Lord. Glory in knowing the Lord. Speak, thus saith the Lord. Even the carcasses of men shall fall as dung upon the open field, and as an handful after the harvestmen, and none shall gather them. This is rough imagery. As a result of the Babylonian invasion, the Bible says that the men will fall on the ground, and the Bible word is dung or waste. If you've ever walked through like a field or a pasture, again, I'm not trying to be crude, but I want you to understand the imagery that the Bible is presenting us this morning. When you walk through a field, animals, they do their business anywhere, and it just falls and lands on the ground, and it stays there. And everyone in this agricultural society understood this these stinky piles all over the ground and the bible says that the lives of them would be of such little value to their enemies that when they died they would be like piles of stinking dung all throughout the pasture just to smell there and to rot This is incredible imagery. It's so important that we we see that the the Bible is taking this so serious. Verse 23, Thus saith the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither the mighty glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. To glory in something means to place value in it, to to relish in it, to trust it. Uh, The Bible says uh, that that a person that is rich or smart or powerful, those will not be enough. Those will not be means by which you can deliver yourself in that day. Uh, uh, Your riches are not going to save you. Your your wealth, your your education, your power, your status is not going to save you. The only thing that will save you is the Lord. Uh, We should not uh, glory in anything. If you have the blessing today of having some money to your name, realize that that's from God. It's not because of you or your hard work or your education or your inheritance or whatever it is. It's from the Lord. And and here in the U.S., we have our educational systems. We have our uh, 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 running water. We have our electricity that I've spent a lot on this week. Uh, We we have a a lot of things that realize that none of we we have. Thank God for our military and those that serve for us. But but God is saying none of those things matter in front of a holy God. Nothing can replace our trust for God. Let not the wise man glory in his riches. We need to remember everything is from God. God uh, does not uh, uh, fail us. Uh, God blesses us incredibly, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me. Folks, if you're going to brag about anything, brag about Jesus. Amen. If you're going to, it's not about, well, you, you, you know, I lost 22 pounds. Yeah, uh, you, you know, you're not going to believe it. Add another comma to the list. Look how much money I have saved. Or, or look at my accomplishments. Or, or look at this. Hey, thank God for the money you can save. Thank God for the weight you can lose. Thank God for the degrees you can achieve. But realize it's all from God. 
and, and none of that stuff. You, you know, do you think, you really think when I stand before God one day, I'm going to look at him and say, you're 32? You're a size 32? Uh, Ken, you did it. Uh, I mean, I'm proud of you. It's not going to happen. Uh, he's not going to look at my, he's not going to say, hey, show me on Twitter again the degrees on your wall, Ken. I, I, wow, that's, that's that, 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 good, good boy. Uh, it, that, that's not it. It's Jesus. It's all about him. He is before all things, and by him all things consist. Verse 25, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, and I will punish all them which are circumcised with the uncircumcised. This is God's covenant people. This is the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And God said, I'm going to treat you like everyone else. And I need you to understand today, it's easy for us sitting in a church to say, yeah, one day those bad people, they're going to get theirs. They're going to get their judgment. But there's going to be church people, people that sat in churches, people that held Bibles, people that taught classes that are going to stand before God and they will have to pay for their sin because they never had a relationship with God. On Wednesday evening, I took a couple of the girls, my, uh, my daughters, to the city, and we, we walked around, and we, we got some Starbucks, and we, we, we did whatever. We just hung out for a little bit, and, uh, and we were driving home, and we were uh, t- taking the, the Bruckner, on, uh, Bruckner Expressway on 95, where it kind of curves into the, the bad traffic area, uh, where there's just always traffic and potholes and all this, and we looked over uh, to our left, uh, and we saw a car fire like I've never seen a car fire before. I would guess, Johnny, the flames were probably 20 or so, maybe 30 feet in the air. It was, just, it was, it was, it was incredible, like to a point that I was talking to Denise on the phone and me and the girls, we were kind of having fun cutting up, and we said, we've got to go. Uh, we're okay, but it was so heartbreaking to watch this entire car engulfed in flames. I mean, the inferno of this vehicle that was heading southbound on 95, getting ready to go across the George Washington Bridge. I don't know where they were going to go. Were they taking a family trip to the Jersey Shore? Uh, were they, were they uh, business work? They were just going about their night, getting ready to cross the bridge. Whatever it was that happened, I don't know if it was an electrical fire, don't know if it was an accident. All I saw was a massive ball of fire, a car engulfed in flames, and I, and I, and I saw a number of, of, uh, uh, of people people that had stopped but there wasn't even the fire personnel that was there and it was just it was just an incredible inferno of flames and the only thing that my daughters and I could say to each other was I hope no one was in there because if they got in there they're not making it out folks many in this world when they go to hell they're not going to make it out if you're, say, uh, if you're not saved today, you're on your way to hell. This person or people, whoever was in that car, were just headed southbound on 95. They had other intentions. But there came a day when it was over. And those plans stopped. And the only question is, was not, are you going to make it to the shore? Are you going to make it to your destination? It's, did you escape the fire? Did you escape the judgment? And folks, I have to ask you, you cannot escape it on your own. You have to realize it's Jesus. He paid the price for you. He died on the cross. He went through it all so that you could have eternal life. But you have to trust Him or you will have to pay Pay for it yourself. How heartbreaking it was to watch a ball of fire. Can you imagine for all of eternity the millions upon billions of people that will have to hear those words of terror? Depart from me. I never knew you. But the truth is you can know Jesus because he wants a relationship with you. 
He's not an angry guy trying to throw people in hell and zap people with lightning bolts. Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. You and I were lost. The reason that Jeremiah preached this message is because these were people that did not know God. They did not have a relationship with God. Folks, I beg you today. I I know that I'm not using the most uplifting terms to encourage you, but I don't want to encourage somebody that's on the road to destruction. I want to warn you. I want to make you aware you're on a path to destruction. Maybe you are saved today. Let me encourage you, don't go back down the path that you were on before Jesus saved you. The, The life of following Jesus is a life of peace. Yes, there's trials, but it's so much easier letting Jesus fight your battles than fighting those on your own. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. There's something different the way a Christian mourns and the way the world mourns. As Dr. Ray began the service this morning, a number of people facing uh, heartbreak in their lives. But we don't face that alone as Christians. Jesus is with us. As we conclude our service in prayer, if you've never been saved, call upon the Lord. Ask Him to save you. If you still have questions, please see me after the service. See one of our ushers, and we'll get you to a quiet place. We'll take the Bible and show you how you can know for sure that you're saved. But you can do it right there in your seat. You can call upon the Lord and ask forgiveness of your sins. If you're here today, if you're, you know you're on that wrong path, let me encourage you to listen to the warning that the Lord gives us today. Let's pray together.